Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to The Discriminating Gamer. You know, I recently fell face first into some bushes. Total face plant. Ladies and gentlemen, today we're going to go ahead and take a look at Archie's War, Battle for Guadalcanal from Worthington Games. We'll get back to the review in just a moment. I want to take a minute to ask you to check out my other channel, that is Cody Carlson PhD, where we talk about history, books on history, military history. I even post some of my uh, lectures for my classes on there. Please check that out. Please subscribe to that channel. And now, back to the review. Alexander Archer Vandegrift is the titular Archie in Archie's War, the Battle for Guadalcanal from Worthington Games. And uh, essentially, this is a game about the defense of uh, Battle uh, of Guadalcanal, of, of the Marine foothold on Guadalcanal around Henderson Field uh, during the 1942 and the 43 battle. Now, essentially, how the game works is you can play it as either a two player game or as a solitaire game. Now, first of all, with a two player game, essentially, you're going to set up a number of units, uh, American units, kind of right in the center of the board, then along the, some of the locations on the periphery, you'll put the Japanese. Now, there's approaches to the Japanese, uh, to the Henderson Phil for the Japanese from the east or the west, or they can actually go through the trails and then attempt to attack from the rear. Now, I should point out, the game comes with a number of different block counters with uh, stickers on them, and it, all of the ones you just get rid of. You don't use the ones in the two-player game. Now, essentially, on a player's turn, they can move uh, groups of units in the same, same location. They can move them, and usually they can move them... Uh, there's an unlimited movement there, um, except in one notable case, which I'll mention. But they go ahead and they can move, but they can only move, they can only resolve one attack per turn. So you can't attack from both sides on the same turn, you can only attack from one side, the Japanese player. But they can go ahead and they can attack. Now, the Marines, um, they too have units with various strength numbers, but they also have Vandegrift. Vandegrift is the general, and he represents kind of the various support artillery and, and other weapons. So if ever the Japanese uh, come up to declare a battle, you reveal all the blocks in that location. And whoever has the greater combined number of blocks wins the game. However, if Vandegrift is there, he automatically wins any engagement he is in. Now, the Japanese get constant reinforcements, but the Americans don't get reinforcements until, I believe, after turn three. So they're, it's kind of trying to hang on, and then they can start getting reinforcements as well. But critically, uh, you know, at the end of your turn, you can kind of move around your units. At least the Americans can kind of rearrange their units. Um, on the board. And this is important because you're going to draw many blocks that are kind of used for bluffing, um, both the Japanese and the Americans, but they also, if you, you can play them, you can remove them as an action to do certain things. For instance, the Japanese can do a, a bombardment action or, or a major bombardment where they can just kind of try to guess and, and take units off the board. And then, of course, after a while, you do Japanese attrition where the American player can just pick a Japanese block and take it off the board. Now, these things are important because what the Japanese player ultimately wants to do is take Vandegrift off the board. And, of course, the Americans want to take the higher-numbered Japanese uh, casualties off the board as well. So what this amounts to is you're, you're going back and forth. I think uh, the, the, the uh, American player is trying to hold on, I think, for 10 turns. And as you're, as you're doing this, as you're going back and forth on the board, you're kind of randomly uh, guessing, you know, where, where is the other guy got his units, right? So it's kind of a bluffing game here uh, over the course of the game. But if the Japanese ever take Henderson Field, they immediately win the game. Or if they get adjacent to Henderson Field three times, they can bombard it and they win the game. If at the end of game turn 10, they have not been able to do that, then the Americans win the game. 
But then, of course, you also have the Solitaire version of the game. The Solitaire version game is a little bit different. It lasts several more rounds, um, but also, too, you've got, like, a track for the airfield. And I think it starts at zero. But what you're trying to do is build up the airfield. And the Americans essentially can take different actions. They pick an action, and then they kind of roll die to see what the Japanese are going to do. Are they going to come forward? Are they going to attack? Um, and then the Americans, as I say, one of the things they can do is they can attempt to build up the airfield, to build up air power, and then in any battles, they can add air power to that engagement there to bolster their numbers. Now, if ever one side or the other has a higher number, then the loser loses kind of one strength point. Um, so, you know, then has to move back. So essentially, you're trying to stop the Japanese from advancing either on east or west or from the south. But there's also reserves that they, they, the Japanese can put stuff into reserves, which can bolster uh, any side during an attack as well as their numbers. So again, the American is pretty much just trying to keep them out. But as you're rolling the Japanese, you may get Japanese events, which can be kind of random things that happen. And then the Americans can also choose to kind of call in the Navy for help, in which case they can roll uh, die and see exactly how the Navy is going to help them. And there's different outcomes that may come there as well. But again, if the Americans' uh, position, if they can hold Henderson Field until the end of the game, then they win! Archie's War, Battle for Guadalcanal. So this game is, um, it's a fairly light game. I played it both as the, um, as a two-player game and as the solitaire game. And, um, the two-player game, like I say, it really just feels like a bluffing game. You know, obviously you're, you're going and you're attacking, you're comparing the numbers, but you're trying to figure out where your enemy has their strongest units, or in the case of the Japanese, you're trying to figure out where the enemy has Vandegrift. Because it can be kind of frustrating for the Japanese because Vandegrift can always win, but he can't be everywhere is the thing, right? So it's kind of an interesting bluffing game, like I say, more than anything else. More, I mean, it's a war game, obviously, but it feels, there's no, like, dice chucking here. It feels really like it is a uh, a war, or a, a game of bluff and double bluff than it, than it feels like a legitimate war game in that sense. And it's fun, and I enjoyed it. But I think the game really shines as a solitaire game. I liked it, uh, you know, because again, it's it's just trying to keep the enemy at bay. You're making choices every round, but then you roll for these random Japanese attacks. You don't know which side they're going to come at you, or if they're going to try to sneak around you, and you've got to stop. And you've got you've got you know kind of a your die roll for, uh, you know you know the, the attacks and whatnot. It feels a little bit more like a like a war game, and it's a little more of a conventional, um, well, like more of a conventional war game. I enjoyed them both. I thought they're both great modes to play. But if this were just sold as the two-player game, I don't, I don't know that I'd need it. I mean, it's fun and I like it, and I'm glad I have it. But I don't know that it's one I'd pick up. But, but with the with a solitaire uh, game here, that's really a lot of fun, and I really enjoy playing this game solitaire quite a bit. And my only caveat is, it feels like compared to a lot of similar solitaire games, like say, you know. Uh, Tarawa 1943, which is just a bear. This one was a little on the easy side. I mean, not so easy that I wouldn't play it, but it, it feels like it's a little easier than than I'd like. You know, I, I, I prefer to lose more games in a solitaire game than I win. Um, so it, it is a little on the easy side, but I still really liked it. I still really enjoy it, and I think there's some kind of things you can do to to kind of maybe improve difficulty there. But anyway, long story short, I did enjoy Archie's War. I think it's a fun game. It's an engaging game. If you're looking for a game that's got both a two-player and a solitaire variant, they're both fun, different, but fun. And that, uh, you know, the, it, there, there's not a high learning curve. It's a fairly easy and engaging game to play and still a lot of fun. Then I recommend uh, Archie's War. Buy it. Well, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for joining us today on The Discriminating Gamer. As always, we ask you to please leave a comment for us on YouTube, on Board Game Geek, on our Facebook page, or on thediscriminatinggamer.com. We ask you to please like us on Facebook, subscribe to us on YouTube, and follow us on Twitter. I'd also ask you, ladies and gentlemen, to check out our other channel, that is Cody Carlson PhD, where we talk about military history and books on history. I'm actually currently posting my uh, lectures for World War II on that channel, so please check it out. Please subscribe to that channel. It would mean a lot to me. And please give this video a thumb on Board Game Geek as well. You know, ladies and gentlemen, the other day I had such an urge to run around naked, so I sprayed myself with Windex. It prevents streaking. All right, let's try it again. Okay. But this time with flair. Yeah. <laughs>